And so, our third speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Knott. Uh, Dr. Knott is currently the Professor of Strategy at the Olin, Olin Business School at Washington University. She has a BS in Math and MBAs and a doctoral degree in Management, both from UCLA. Uh, she's also taught at the Wharton School of Business, as well as spending time in industry at Hughes Aircraft Corporation, where she developed missile guidance systems. The current focus of her research is on firms' behavior and the impact on performance, and with this she's been studying and developing new metrics. Her work has been highly recognized by the business world media and forms the basis for her talk this morning, which is entitled, Demonstrating and Improving the Value of R&D. Anne-Marie. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Steve. Um, as Steve said, my job here today is to tell you how to demonstrate quantitatively the value of R&D. Um, before getting into that, clip, or Steve already alluded to this, but this was my world before I became an academic. I was actually the person on the uh, left because we were not allowed to touch hardware. <laughs> uh, one of the things that happens if you develop missiles for a living is you say, as you sublimate, I'm not developing weapons, I'm pushing the knowledge frontier. And I took that quite seriously, so I became upset when the, uh, the government was changing its acquisition policies and firms were changing their uh, R&D strategies in response to that, because I thought what was happening was that uh, they were changing the way that R&D was conducted in an irreversible way. Uh, the problem at the time is I couldn't demonstrate that. I could, there was no way to show that R&D capability was deteriorating. Okay. It appears that I might have been right. So this shows you a chart that compares the um, R&D intensity of firms to GDP growth. And through much of the space race, what was happening is that GDP growth would track R&D spending, but with a lag of about 15 years. What happened, uh, as you can see, in about the 1980s is that R&D spending uh, declined. GDP tracked that, but when R&D picked back up, GDP growth didn't. Um, so, what we want, what firms want, and what the government wants with respect to R&D is we want to be able to restore this kind of growth. Um, so why do I think that we got this disconnect between the growth and R&D spending? And uh, I believe the answer is we were flying blind. Okay? There's no good measures of R&D effectiveness. Uh, a very common measure is sales divided by R&D, but that's basically just taking the input measure and inverting it. Okay. Another very common measure is patents. The problem with patents is that they're neither uniform nor universal. And when I say um, uh, universal, what I mean is only 50% of firms, and you're, you're the audience here, only 50% of firms patent what they uh, innovate. Okay. And of those that do patent, uh, the patents themselves have highly variable values. So about 10% of patents account for 85% of the economic value of patents. Um, both of the measures have the problem that neither of them is reliable in predicting market value, which is what you guys need to be able to demonstrate uh, the value of what you're doing. Okay, so this has two implications for firms. The first implication is firms don't know how much to spend. So what I've got on this chart on the right-hand axis is the computed value, which I can now do, of optimal spending. And on the y-axis, what I have is the actual spending that firms are doing. So if firms are spending optimally, they should line up on the red diagonal. And what you can see is that about half of the firms are overspending, the ones that are on the top left, um, and on the, uh, the other half of firms are underspending, so the ones on the bottom right. So typically what's happening is small firms are overspending and large firms are underspending. Only about 5% of firms are investing within plus or minus 10% of the optimal amount. So that's the front end implication. The back end implication is that firms aren't sure what makes them effective or prevents them from um, being effective. So what I have on this chart on the X axis is their R&D productivity over one 10 year period. And on the Y axis, what I have is their R&D productivity 10 year, you know, in, the, in the subsequent 10 year period. So if firms are able to improve their capability, they should all be moving up and to the left. Uh, if they're merely maintaining their capability, they're gonna stay on the diagonal. Okay, but what you see is something that looks more like shotgun. So firms can change, but what they appear to be doing now is changing randomly. 
So putting these two pieces together, the piece of um, knowing what to spend and figuring out how effective you're spending in, so I have the story of um, Mark Hurd of Hewlett Packard. Um, I believe there might be one person from Hewlett Packard here, so you can talk to me after about this. You remember, uh, it was about four years ago, he was um, let go at HP nominally for cook awarding with a porn star. Um, there was a column, Joe Nocero's column in the New York Times, was quoting uh, Charles House, who was a former engineer and en an engineering manager at uh, HP. And uh, House said that the, um, you know, the porn star, the porn star episode was really just the. the uh, the impetus for this, that they'd been wanting to get rid of him all along because he had destroyed the innovation engine that had made HP great. And he said, as an example, our R&D budget used to be 9% and currently it's 2%. Okay. So, is Mr. House right? The problem with the current measures is we just don't know. We don't know whether R&D capability has deteriorated, or if so, by how much, and we don't even know whether 9% is the right number or whether 2% is the right number. So, I've set up the problem for you. What I want to do for the rest of the talk is give you the RQ solution. Um, I want to put it to use. I want to show you not only how you can use it, but other important constituencies that you care about uh, can use it as well. So if investors understand the value of R&D, that will make your life easier as well. Similarly, if policymakers will uh, understand it, that, that should facilitate policies that allow you to do better R&D. And then finally, I'm going to show how you personally can demonstrate the value of R&D inside your companies using the measure. Um, the illusion is to savor metrics. I'm, of course, a big Billy Bean fan. <laughs> so I want you to think about this is uh, wins over replacement, all right, for those of you who are also Billy Beans or Saber Metrics fans. All right, so Martha's going to cringe because she did not want me to do um, anything too equation oriented, um, but I want you to have confidence in this measure. You guys all had Greek in your background somewhere. Um, so let me just tell you what the real fundamental um, definition of this measure is. So uh, those of you who had economics may remember that there was something called a production function. So the production function is this equation y equals a to the alpha, b to the beta. And what it is, is it's an equation that links the inputs to firm's outputs. Okay, so if we look at it over here on the right-hand side, you can depict it graphically. So you have input A and input B. So typically A would be capital and B would be labor. And you can see uh, these red isoquants are levels of output. So if you want to produce this inner on this inner isoquant, you can do that by using a lot of B and a little bit of A. Conversely, you can use a lot of A and a little bit of B. Okay. Um, so it's the defining the sort of substitution between the inputs as well as telling you what the, um, what the output is. And sort of this magic point here on any of the isoquants is defined uh, by this other, this other line here, which is the relative price line. So if you have these isoquants defined by this equation and you have this price line, you can figure out what's the optimal level of both A and B. Okay. So that's the basics of the production function. Now I expand that in two ways. The first thing that I do is I add the intangibles, which are the things that you care about. So R&D, of course, advertising, the other one that's going to drive your brand. And then there's one that's actually at the free input that's called spillovers. It's important to include that because some firms basically do no R&D and benefit from the R&D of everybody else. And that's what captures this. So this is what you get through going to conferences, from reading people's papers, from backward engineering, uh, and from stealing other people's employees. Uh, the second thing that you, I do is I make the um, exponents firm specific. So when economists talk about the production function, they think every firm in an industry uh, has the exact, you know, is exactly the same essentially. And so that they'll have the same, uh, they'll have the same exponents for all of their inputs. If you've ever worked in industry, you recognize that uh, that's impossible to believe. Um, so, uh, RQ stands for research quotient. Um, is what it is exactly is it's this exponent on R and D in this production function. Um, the term, the, spe the specific term for it is it's the firm specific output elasticity of R and D. 
You only need to know that if you're going to talk to an economist and you want him to have confidence in the measure. The way to think about it in lay terms is it's the percentage increase in output from a 1% increase in R&D. Okay. okay. So what's cool and interesting about RQ? So it's got important properties. I told you earlier that there were problems with the other measures. So first of all, it's universal. You can, you can generate this measure for any firm who does R&D as long as you can get hold of their financials. It's uniform. It's essentially a ratio, output on the left-hand side in dollars and inputs in dollars on the right-hand side. So it's, um, you know, it's apples at apples, okay? Uh, it's reliable. So one of the things that R&D productivity should predict, and I derived all this through theory, is it should predict R&D spending. If you have higher productivity, you should have higher optimal investment. You should have higher market value, and I'll show you that in a second. And you should have higher firm growth. And this is the only measure for which that's true. If you look at patent intensity, it turns out that's actually negatively core. It has negative um, values for each of these things. Okay, so it's a very scary measure. And it's the most common measure in economics, unfortunately. Um, and then finally, if you, if you like endorsements, um, the National Science Foundation has given me a grant to actually link this measure to the annual survey that you probably do on your uh, R&D practices. So, uh, you know why we need a measure, you know what the measure actually is, how do we put it to use? So as I said, there's actually three constituencies. There's you, which are primary, so it's going to help you set your optimal budget, and I'm going to talk about that. It's going to help you benchmark and improve, and I'll talk about that. What it does for investors, it provides them a fundamental value for R&D. So you probably all know that Warren Buffett issues tech stocks precisely because he says, I don't know how to value them, and now there's a way that he can do that. And then finally, policymakers will have a better uh, understanding of the levers that Chase should be doing to drive GDP growth. So one thing that this will tell them is that it's that R&D, you know, blanket R&D tax credits is a really bad idea because I've just showed you that half of the people are already overspending on R&D. Okay, they should not be getting credits to do that because that's just wasting taxpayers' money and giving them additional incentives to overspend. Okay. Um, don't get scared. <laughs> um, I, all I want to show you is that you can derive the optimal spending once you have this measure. Um, exactly what it is, is you just uh, put it into the profit equation, take the derivative of the profit equation with respect to R&D spending, and you get this messy, this messy expression, but you just spreadsheet it. Um, so once you have all these, in, all these measures, uh, it's a spreadsheet exercise. Um, the, uh, as I said, the studies that we've done with this measure show that firms sort of have an intuition. Firms that are higher pro have higher productivity or have higher RQ actually seem to understand that they have higher, uh, that they should have higher spending. Um, and that we also find that market value of firms is highest when they have the optimal spending. Okay, so how important is getting the spending piece right? So this was an article in Harvard Business Review a couple years ago, and it turns out that just for the top 20 firms, it was worth a trillion dollars of market value. Okay? The way that you do this is, and I'll just show you what this exercise is for these firms, um, you derive their, uh, you look at their revenue, you derive their R RQ, which is the measure, um, you look at their R&D spending, compare it to the optimal spending, and then this column that's probably most interesting is telling you whether they're overspending or underspending, and two of the firms are overspending. So uh, uh, that would be the pharmaceutical firms because that world's changed. Um, so then what you can do is you can compute what the profit increase will be for cutting out that overspending in those firms' cases, or for increasing R&D by about 10% for the other firms, because you know you can't ramp up to the full amount immediately. And if you do that, you can figure out what the increase on profits would be, link that to the P-E ratio, and you get the market value. Okay, so the first application is getting the spending piece right. The second application is benchmarking. So we'll go back to the Mark, uh, the Mark Hurd story. Um, it turns out that Mark Hurd was not responsible for taking the firm from 9% to 12% to 2%. In fact, the spending peak was back under Packard's day, so it was 12%. So Lou Platt 
started the decline, and that was perpetuated by Carly Fiorina, and Mark was just following suit. So that's what they were doing with respect to spending. But on the productivity side, the, number that we, the figure that we care about here is the red piece, which is the RQ piece. And it turns out that the R&D productivity was actually increasing under Mark Hurd. So you can demonstrate those kinds of things. The third firm application, and this is the one I'm most excited about, is that firms can change their RQ. So, um, I showed you currently that what happens, or what appears to be happening, is firms are changing randomly. Um, but if they can actually systematically improve their RQ, and they, they will have an incentive to do so because it will actually increase their market value. So a 10% increase in your R &Q, RD to the uh, gamma, which is RQ, uh, is a 4.3% increase in your market value. So it's pretty substantial. So the holy grail for me is that RQ will do for R&D, what TQM did for manufacturing, and what hospital report cards are doing for uh, hospital morbidity and mortality. But I need you guys to help me with that. Okay, so that's the firm application. The investor application you should care about um, because these are the guys who put pressure on you to get the current period profits. So here's a quote that I showed to, shared with my students in the fall. Um, and this comes from the Wall Street Journal. 3M clearly has more of a long-term focus and less desire to please investors every quarter, said Shannon O'Callaghan, an analyst at Nomura. That's admirable up to a point, but when do they acknowledge the expectations of the equity investors and finally give them what they're looking for? I mean, it's crazy. The long-term focus is precisely what the equity investors should be looking for. Uh, and this is may, why they may start to care. So what I've done here is I took the measure uh, and went back 40 years. So I actually know the measures for all publicly traded firms going back 40 years in the United States. Uh, and on a lark, uh, I played with some. I, I played with the portfolio, and then I did it systematically. So what you see here is the um, kind of the purple line is the portfolio of the top. Uh, quintiles, the top 20% of firms are Qs. And if you invested each year, if you um, rebalanced your portfolio so that you were, in the, uh, the, you were investing in the top 20% uh, of firms each year, uh, given the money that you had at the end of the prior year, um, these are the returns that you would actually get. And if you compare that to the S, so, so pay attention to that top line. Uh, and if you compare that to the standard and poor's, you have four times the return of the standard and poor's. Okay. So investors will see this. One, they'll understand that they have a, fundament, a way to fundamentally value R&D, but they also have, will have a, um, an interest and an appetite for firms that are actually doing R&D and are high on this RQ measure. Uh, and then this final application is uh, the policymaker application. I showed you this chart previously. Um, this is what happens when you plot GDP growth and line up RQ with it. Okay. So it looks as though RQ is actually going to um, be able to help us understand how to drive, how R&D can drive GDP growth again. And once we understand that, then policy should start favoring firms with high RQs. Okay. So uh, this is the piece that's most relevant to you, uh, and this is actually only one chart. So what uh, you want to be able to do is you want to be able to demonstrate the value of what you're doing to your constituency. So you want to do this for your CEO, and you want to be doing this for your investors. So. Um, the first thing that uh, we can do for you, or that I can do for you, you could do for yourself actually. So all the pay, all the all the mechanics behind this are publicly, you know, are part of the public domain because I'm an academic. Um, but to make it simpler, I can do it. You know, I've got a, a, a venture that I can put this together for you in, in uh, five seconds. Um, so the first thing you can do is you can track where you stand, what your RQ is relative to that of the rivals. Okay, so the RQ scale is basically the same scale as the IQ scale. I did that deliberately so people would have an intuition. So the average IQ, RQ is 100. Uh, one standard deviation is 15 points. So 67% of firms will be between an RQ of 85 and 115, okay? Uh, so in this particular case, I think the firm was the blue line and um, two of the rivals that they were interested in comparing themselves to were the red and green line. Uh, the second thing that I can do is I can show you what your spending is relative to your optimal spending. 
Uh, so in this particular case, the optimal spending was in green and the um, actual spending was in blue. Okay, I remember presenting uh, something like this to, um, to a, a firm, a client, and uh, they looked at this chart and they just said, you know, this is crazy. We want to diffuse this methodology throughout the firm. We show a chart like this. They're going to laugh us out of the room because we can't be off by that much. And then he said, my frustration is that um, I have trouble getting any more R&D dollars. My marketing guys have no trouble getting the dollars that they asked for. And I said, oh, really? You know, how much are they getting? And uh, they were getting four times the budget that the, uh, that the R&D guys were getting. And uh, I said, oh, that's really interesting. So I went back, because it turns out I have the measure for the R&D spending, but I also have the measure for advertising spending for all the firms, too. And it turns out that um, the, uh, in this particular case, it was $10 billion in advertising, and this, in the, what I was saying was the required uh, spending for R&D should be $15 billion. Uh, the $10 billion was exactly optimal for advertising. So the company had really good intuition about how much they should be spending on, our, on advertising. And the reason is, you actually see the benefits from your advertising in the current year. You don't see the benefits from your R&D for several years, and that's why people don't develop very good intuitions about how productive they are. Okay. Uh, and then the final piece is the, the piece that uh, I pulled together as part of the HBR article, which is I can show you if you increase your R&D X percent, what should the expected market value be as a result of that. Okay, so in summary, uh, you can not only demonstrate the value of RD, ultimately you ought to be able to improve it. The NSF study should start telling me um, what are the practices that are associated with the high RQ companies versus those that are associated with low RQ companies. And once we do that, we can do more of the one and less of the, le of the other. Um, in the short run, however, uh, it's going to remove investor pressure. This is my job, is educating the investors, and remove investor pressure for current profits because um, they now know how to value R&D or they can know how to value R&D. And all you need is some that do it because then everybody else is on the wrong side of trades. Um, you can compute your optimal budget. Um, uh, and that should increase your market value in the short run. Uh, the more interesting and exciting piece, as I said, is that you're going to be able to improve your RQ, uh, which will improve your market value even further. And uh, I can help you help me help you. So I will give you a copy of essentially this, uh, essentially this in a nice, lovely little form in exchange for being able to talk to you about your R&D practices for about an hour. Okay. Thank you.